Well, let's take a look at the DHHS guidelines right now. There's been an update uh, for the use of the antiretroviral agents in adults and adolescents. How does this differ from what we used to have in the past? <clears throat> well, what we have now is, is, a, is, is a new categorization where there's a, a recommendation for most people and then there are drugs that are recommended in certain situations. Let's talk about most people first. What, what is the, gosh, I, I, the words that are, that are being used here. What's the usual? Well, this, okay. the, the simple way of saying is that DHHS has weighed in on, on the data and okay. said integrase inhibitors. Integrase inhibitors across the board are recommended in most situations. So what are those drugs? Uh, dolutegravir, elvitegravir, and raltegravir. Okay, so those are the, if you will, the, not the cocktail, but that's the recommendation. Integrase inhibitor-based regimens, but they are all used in combination. And, and in fact, there, there are several single tablet regimens, dolutegravir, bacavir, lamivudine, better known as triumec, uh, dolutegravir with tenofovir and emtricitabine. Um, and that can, uh, it, it would be a two-pill regimen or an so, L-vitegavir-based uh, once-daily regimen. So, so that's, so that's kind of where I was heading with this. I mean, you look at the guidelines, and the guidelines change, which makes it a little bit more challenging uh, to the payer as we set up formularies. Uh, but we want to follow the guidelines. But these are not all single-tablet regimens. Right. So they all have integrase inhibitors, but they're, yeah. some of them are multi So is there... How important, I'm kind of curious, I mean, how important is it two tablets once a day versus one tablet once a day? Is that, is there, is there a huge compliance and persistency difference? And, and, is that, and is that something that we could potentially explore if it saved the patient money and it saved society money? I think, I, I mean, if, if you asked me, or, or I think you just did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I think there isn't any one of us that if we were going to see our doctor and they said, I can give you two pills or I can give you one pill, what would you prefer as a patient? What patient would say, oh, doc, give me two? I'd rather have two, uh, unless there's a reason, that, that a good compelling reason. Yeah. And, and cost is not always a, a, a good sell to the patient. But if, you could, if, but if the cost of the patient was considerably less... I wonder, I wonder if that would... But is the patient seeing any of this cost uh, at all? I mean, uh, isn't that yeah. part of the issue? Well, the, the challenge is we don't have an HIV formulary. We don't have an HIV, be, HIV benefit. We have a benefit. And because of the pipelines and specialty drugs and the trends of these drugs, we're, we've seen in the last five years a doubling of what, we're spend, what we spend on drugs. And it's probably going to double again in the next two or three years. So we don't have a lot of mechanisms to address that. The few mechanisms we have put the member in the middle of it. It's moving to deductibles. It's moving to coinsurance. It's closing formularies. So at some point... Uh, I think these patients, either directly or indirectly, will see the impact of, of the cost of these medications. But remember also the history of this, was that early on in the epidemic, the perception, rightly or wrongly, was that the drug companies were pricing these drugs, those primitive drugs by comparison to today's drugs, usuriously. They were, they were, they were price gouging is what people were concerned about and they were protesting about. I recall a, a group of people who chained themselves to the balcony in the, U, in the New yeah. York Stock Exchange yeah. because of that. Well, inflammatory disease and the price increases of multiple sclerosis and hepatitis C mm -hmm. have uh -huh. shifted the focus. But if you take a look at this, like I said earlier, this is still a top five or six category. And a lot of these single tablet regimens are, are pushing $40,000 a year. So they are very, very expensive. And, yeah. but, but if they lend themselves to a greater degree of adherence with much less side effects and much less safety concern over time, and, re and remember we started off this discussion saying that our patients are yeah. living longer, they're going to be exposed to medications for years and years, if not decades, you know, that could be key and important. I, I definitely agree. The, the outcome and the cure and everything, all the things we've been talking about d definitely is still the objective. I think, though... We, we should, be, I don't think we've had a, a, a very good cost conversation to date. I think that has to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. And where it, where it potentially changes is, is as we get more of these single tablet regimens and they're made by different manufacturers or we have generics, is there an appropriate way to take advantage of that without affecting the patient and the outcome? Well, and I just need to remind everyone that managed care organizations don't make these decisions in a vacuum. They take into, consider, or into consideration effectiveness, safety, and cost. So all of these are taken into, into consideration when that formulary is developed.